Hello, everyone. Welcome to free policy seminar, The Future of Food and Agriculture, Drivers and Triggers of Transformation, co-organized by Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, IFPRI, and the CGI Research Initiative on Foresight. My name is Evgenia Anisimova. I'm Media, Media and Digital Engagement Manager with IFPRI, and it's my great pleasure to moderate this event. The title of this seminar is the same as the title of the recently published FAO report, which analyzes current and emerging drivers of agri-food systems and their possible future trends. And today, we're lucky to have with us Lorenzo Giovanni Bilou, Senior Economist and Lead of the Policy Intelligence Branch Global Perspectives with FAO, who is one of the co-authors of the report and who will, give his, who will give us an overview of the key findings. We will then have a panel discussion about some of the challenges facing food and agriculture globally, as well as the foresight approaches to exploring alternative future pathways and opportunities for future system transformation, with particular focus on the Americas. After that, we will have time to answer questions from our online audience. So please feel free to submit your comments and questions on ifree.org, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, wherever you're watching us, or by using hashtag AskIfPree on Twitter. Before I hand it over to Lorenzo, Maximo Terrero, FAO Chief Economist, will set the stage with his introductory remarks. Unfortunately, Maximo couldn't join us live, so he sent us this video message. Dear colleagues, thank you so much uh, for allowing uh, us to present the future of food and agriculture drivers and triggers of transformation. Thank you to IFPRI for hosting us and for the director, Joe Swim. This report aims to enrich the strategic thinking of FAO, but also, we hope, of the development community. So I hope this discussion will be very active and will allow us to, to learn from, from each other. As all of you know, the agri-food system is under significant risk and uncertainties. And what we have seen in the last three years it's a piece of it. It's a piece of what could be coming in the future uh, and where we need to find ways in which we can increase resilience and especially sustainability. As clearly stated in this report, the medium and long term future of the agri food systems cannot be predicted. There are complex sets of interconnections and interactions with different sectors, energy sector now, the health sector, as we saw in COVID-19, and the, nat the natural sector, the, and the different activities done in the agri food system, which is not just crops, it's also livestock fisheries, forestry, aquaculture, all of them are interrelated and which makes very complex to be able to assess the situation that we are facing today. And this report points our attention to 18 drivers of the agri-food systems, uh, and, and they are not ranked in any order. All of them are important, but show the dynamics and the complexity of population dynamics, urbanization, economic growth, macroeconomic stability, climate change, water stress, and of course, uh, innovation and inequality. So I will just to want to highlight three core challenges that I think this report brings up where we can center our discussion. The first challenge is that food is very unequally distributed across countries and households. And this is reflected by the numbers that we are observing on the SDG2 indicators. Between 702 and 828 million people facing chronic hunger in 2021, and this number will be on the increase in 2022 and 2023, uh, more than 3 0.1 billion people that cannot afford the minimum cost healthy diets, all the indicators of nutrition not reaching its targets of 2030. And also at the same time, uh, we face significant shortfalls in many countries on access and availability of the different food groups that are needed to be able to achieve um, and the healthy diets that they require. The second challenge is climate change uh, and the lack of sustainability of the agri-food systems. Climate change will affect in four dimensions. It will affect because of extreme temperatures, droughts, like what, the, what we are seeing in Argentina. It will affect because of flooding, like what we saw in Pakistan. It will affect because of variability, given the temperatures and the level of rainfall will vary. That will create more volatility and more volatility on prices and therefore more difficult to forecast. And fourth, it could create an effect over the changes in which uh, diseases uh, and pests and diseases will evolve as they adapt uh, to the climate. So we need to look at that very carefully. Second, in terms of the, of the sustainability, land, water, soil, and biodiversity are progressively degrading. 
soil nutrient depletion, extensive deforestation, overexploitation of marine resources, and pastures and pollution at all levels uh, raise concerns, not only on the agri-food systems, but also on the broader socioeconomic systems and stability of the environment. At the same time, we know agriculture is a significant contributor, 20% of the global greenhouse gas emissions, and it is estimated that the whole system contributes around one third. So it's not only impacted by climate, but it's also a contributor to the problem that generates the climate change problem. And finally, the third challenge is that we will need to produce more with less. That means that we need to be able to satisfy the potential growth of the population that is projected by the UN population division to be around 10 billion by 2050. And that means that we will need to produce a lot more food uh, in the future to be able to achieve the demand of this new population. An additional 2 billion people in less than 30 years from now. And that means that we need to change how we produce because we also have to assure sustainability. So that means producing more with less. Now, addressing all these challenges a lot makes us, it's so important to understand that we cannot be in the business as usual. And we need to find ways in which we can change, understand the trade-offs of all the actions we do to be able to achieve the transformation that is needed. And this report focuses on not only demand side effects, but also on supply side. On the demand side effects, for example, we will need to look at how we can shift diets through behavioral change or, and also through policies that will enable how we better provide proper incentives for consumers to demand foods which are more uh, healthy for them and therefore reduce not only undernourishment but also overnourishment, overweight and obesity. At the same time, we need to have demand side policies and provisions that will create public goods uh, as education and transparent information that may, prom that may promote these changes in, in, in behavior that we are expecting. On the supply side, we need to look at technology, we need to look at science and the evidence and how we can do use also other approaches like agroecological approaches that could create cost benefit incentives for farmers to change to adaptation so that they can reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But at the same time, we cannot forget the potential issues of mitigation. So we need to look at both demand and supply. And one topic which cross across both of them is, of course, the repurposing of subsidies, which could be through consumers, but also through the producer side, so that we can provide the proper incentives to align and to minimize all the trade-offs of any policy that is implemented towards achieving SDG2. Now, it is important to understand that the challenges ahead are enormous, uh, and we need to work together to try to find and move towards a smart governments, a smart policy designs, and which we can really be effective in the changes that we provide, so that we well inform countries and work with them to create the transformation that they need. Looking at different alternative futures and using modeling tools to be able to simulate what will be the potential impact are central in that sense. And I think this report is just one element that could help in the, into, as an input towards this discussion. So I kindly invite all of you to look at the introductory video and hear more about the report from uh, Mr. Bellu, which will be presenting uh, and summarizing what we have in, in this report. Thank you very much, and I wish you a great discussion.
Thank you very much to Maximo for this introduction and for the to FAO colleagues for this beautiful video that served as a nice curtain raiser. And the floor is yours, Lorenzo. Hello, hello everybody, all the participants. Thanks, uh, Evgenia, for giving me the floor. Um, you will stay with me for 10 minutes because um, I want to share with you some of the um, findings of this report uh, and uh, to involve you a bit in the process that we followed to achieve this report. Uh, if uh, we may start uh, with the slides. Uh, um, next, uh, please. Uh, you see that uh, this uh, report uh, is the result of a long pathway that went uh, through uh, different steps. Uh, what we call the corporate foresight, uh, corporate strategic foresight exercise. This corporate strategic foresight exercise was meant to enrich uh, and to, to ground, in a sense, the programmatic efforts of FAO in the next 10 years, but at the same time also to uh, identify uh, some findings uh, about possible futures to share them with the global community at large. This, uh, the pattern that we followed started with mapping ag agri-food systems, defining what we mean with agri-food system, what is when we say agri-food systems. And then it went through the identif identification of driving forces uh, that influence, that have influenced in the past and they are they're likely to influence even the future of agri-food systems. Um, a lot of work has been done to analyze these drivers and the interactions among these drivers uh, with the aim uh, of what? To, to detect weak signals of uh, possible futures. I will come back to that, uh, uh, to this issue of weak signals to give you some examples of what uh, I mean with that. Uh, but um, recombining all these weak signals of possible futures, we ended up with four narratives uh, of uh, uh, future uh, possible future scenarios, which are alternatives. They are both snapshots of possible futures and pathways to reach them. Uh, well, given the fact that we have not run this exercise just for the sake of uh, speculating about the future, but with the aim of influencing through different channels, decision making towards uh, sustainability and resilience, uh, we identified also triggers of change. What do we need uh, to do? Uh, if we want to change towards uh, sustainability and resilience. And uh, of course, uh, and then how to trigger these triggers to, if you allow me this, to play with the words, for uh, true strategies and policy options. So without uh, any further delay, let me uh, explain, let me show what are the narratives in a nutshell of our uh, alternative futures. Next, please. So we started uh, um, from uh, previous works uh, on the future of food and agriculture and uh, identified uh, where we identified business as usual as one of the scenarios. But we said, okay, even if we do more of the same, if, even if we increase the size, the volume of what we do, but we don't change, uh, this uh, more of the same scenario may lead uh, to degradation of our food systems anyway. And, uh, possible collapses or si of significant parts of agri-food systems. Given the fact that this is not the only possible future, we wanted to speculate a bit about uh, what we call adjusted future. This is an alternative scenario where we try to get uh, some quick fixes, in particular under the pressure to achieve uh, Agenda 2030, in terms of uh, well-being of people, you know, more food security, um, less extreme poverty and so on but without really impacting on sustainability in a, a systemic way um, a third scenario is a scenario of pure collapse uh, people asked us to add this scenario because uh, um, it is well possible that if, if we don't uh, care about uh, agri-food systems and uh, we keep degrading environment and we keep uh, not caring about uh, conflicts uh, for natural resources and for energy and so on, uh, we may really end up uh, in a nasty, uh, not uh, um, desirable situation. Well, of course, the, first, the, the fourth scenario is a scenario of transformation, but 
contrarily to many other scenarios where you have sustainability uh, and you have resilience and you have wonderful societies, uh, this trading off for sustainability, as said in the title, implies addressing trade offs. The future of sustainable energy food systems is something that we can reach, but uh, it will not come for free. We will have to give up something. Who has to give up and what to give up? This is a matter of discussion, but essentially, uh, we have to uh, reconsider the way we are address growth issues, the way we measure growth, and uh, the way we distribute uh, income if we want to uh, move towards sustainability. Next, please. So, definition of agri-food systems. All of you may have an idea of what I mean, but essentially we have at the, at the core of uh, agri-food systems uh, um, producing, processing, retailing, and consuming uh, agri-food commodities uh, and products. Some of the driving forces uh, of these uh, agri-food systems are internal to agri-food systems as such, like food prices uh, that may come out of the balance between supply and demand, uh, market concentration, and so on. But other driving forces uh, are outside agri-food systems as such. Socioeconomic systems, in fact, uh, surround agri-food systems. Uh, and uh, next, please. And uh, you see that some of the drivers of agri-food systems, uh, like population dynamics, economic growth, uh, uh, geopolitical instability are all outside uh, agri-food systems as such, but they have a strong influence on it. And uh, of course, also the outcomes uh, that agri-food systems are supplying affect very much uh, um, socioeconomic systems. Income generation, food security, social stability, uh, they are all outcomes that we expect to influence socioeconomic systems. But again, neither agri-food systems nor socioeconomic systems uh, um, work in a vacuum because they are all surrounded by environmental systems. Next. And these environmental systems provide, uh, again, other additional driving, driving forces through scarcity of natural resources, uh, epidemics, climate change, and so on. So, without any further ado, we can go to the next slide. Just to give you, uh, and the next one as well, just to give you uh, the flavor of what I mean with weak signals. Let's take, for example, the driver economic growth. And this is just a variable, which is the per capita GDP at purchasing power parity by region in the last 30 years. Well, the historical trend is a trend where you have some regions uh, which are well below 10,000, and uh, they display a more or, less, uh, more or less steady pattern in the last 30 years, while you have other regions, including high-income countries, which are much above and uh, they are growing. What is the weak, the weak signal that we get out of this uh, example? Is that a convergence between high-income countries and low- and middle-income countries may not occur at a significant pace in the next uh, decade, at least. So we cannot rule out uh, a future of uh, lack of convergence and i would say that to some extent uh, looking at the past trends uh, this is not so unlikely so next uh, please uh, we have another example where you have a structural transformation where you investigate where we investigated uh, the relationship between uh, the share of value added in agriculture and the share of agriculture uh, and share of uh, employment in agriculture Again, the weak signal that we get out of this picture is that not all the regions are the same. In some regions, the classical, the school book uh, transformation pattern uh, is observed in other regions, including Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America, not at all, because we may have a reduction of employment uh, without a reduction of uh, the share of agriculture in GDP, which uh, may signal that uh, the classical way of intending the evolution of agriculture may not be um, something happening in the future in some regions. Next, um, I conclude this set of examples looking at some outcomes. What you find here is the prevalence of undernourishment. You see that uh, the black line is the historical pattern, uh, while the three lines, uh, colored lines, uh, are projections that we prov provided in the previous uh, work, uh, um, Alternative Pathways to 2050. You see that. The historical pattern is following what we considered until a few years ago as the worst case scenario, the red line. The weak signal that we get out of that is that uh, 
it is well possible that the future of uh, exacerbated uh, food insecurity and hunger is, has not been ruled out until now. So uh, let me go to see in the next slide uh, uh, triggers of transformation. Institutions and governance, because we, we feel that there is a mismatch between problems at stake and uh, governance mechanisms that we have in place. Consumer awareness, Maximo has already mentioned the potential of uh, consumers as uh, actors of transformation. Income and wealth distribution is probably one of the most important triggers, considering that uh, we are not paying the, paying the true cost of food now, and food prices may increase in the future if we want to internalize externalities. And uh, innovative technologies and approaches, as Maximo has, has uh, had already mentioned. With no pretension to be exhaustive, we also provide some. Uh, uh, policy options, if you want strategic options uh, to trigger these triggers. In the next slide, uh, we provide, uh, sorry, uh, the next one as well. Uh, next, uh, we provide some examples of, for instance, for governance, transforming voluntary guidelines uh, into enforceable legislation, supporting certification and labeling for consumer awareness, uh, and so on and so forth. I, I don't make the, link, the list too long because uh, otherwise you're not going to browse the report, uh, which is something that uh, I would like you to do because uh, you have a third part of the report, which is uh, uh, you have uh, a lot of examples in this direction. If, I, if you allow me to go back uh, to the previous slide before concluding, uh, it is important that uh, in uh, through these policies and options, uh, we address uh, trade-offs. Maximo has already pointed out that uh, we will not transform agri-food systems without uh, addressing conflicting objectives. Win-win situations will be nice, but uh, they're not going to be so likely. We will have to uh, deal, for instance, with increasing prices to internalize externalities and reducing uh, hunger by uh, increasing access to food. We will have to address the issue of uh, using, using biomasses to produce energy while at the same time not conflicting with uh, food production and so on and so forth. I leave it to you to browse this table and uh, the text that we have in, uh, in the report on uh, conflicting objectives because uh, we cannot uh, um, miss uh, addressing these uh, 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 trade-offs. So let me conclude with a takeaway message uh, that say that it is possible to avoid the collapse of agri-food systems, uh, but uh, we need to act uh, now. Sustainable and resilient development implies costs that uh, somebody will have to pay for. Wealthier countries and societies may be the ones uh, who start transforming and paying this price in order to relieve uh, the burden of transformation uh, to low-income countries and uh, more fragile societies. Of course, there is no way, though, I mean, there is little hope uh, and uh, little signals to be optimistic but I may say that uh, pessimism is a luxury that we cannot afford, all in all, because uh, we have something to do and uh, the challenges uh, ahead uh, require a lot of energy and uh, a lot of commitment. Over for the time. Thanks. Thank you, Lorenzo. Thank you for this comprehensive overview. And we are now moving to the panel discussion. And I'm happy to introduce our panelists really briefly in the interest of time. We have with us Valera Pinheiro, acting head of the Latin American region and senior research coordinator with IFPRI. Um, Joseph Glauber, senior research fellow with IFPRI. Elisabetta Gator, principal scientist and program leader in performance innovation and strategic analysis for impact with the Alliance of Biodiversity and SEAD. And Elisabetta is also a colleague of the CGI Research Initiative on Foresight. And Keith Wiebe, Senior Research Fellow with IFPRI and Lead of the CGI Research Initiative on Foresight. Also, just as a reminder, we'll be coming to our Q&A portion soon, so please continue submitting your questions on the platform that you're watching us. Valeria, my first question is for you. You are leading IFPRI's Latin America program. So my question to you will be from the regional perspective. First, what do you see as the biggest challenges for Latin America in relation to the future of food and agriculture? And then where do you see space for new partnerships, engagements, and capacity building that would help solve those challenges? 
Thank you, Nina. Thank you so much. And, and thank you, everyone, um, uh, for being here with us today. First of all, I would like to uh, congratulate um, FAO for this amazing report. It is um, it was definitely a pleasure to read it because it's a different type of, of report. Um, it brings this strategic uh, uh, thinking and um, not to use the word strategic again, but it's how that vision we need to be able to have a vision or a strategy of how um, we are moving towards. And I think that this kind of uh, report really brings a lot in terms of looking at some possibilities, what the world will look like if, and those if are the things that really uh, matter uh, for us researchers. And I think that it has to be also for um, policymakers and actually all stakeholders to make sure that we're moving towards the right uh, place. And in doing so, we need to understand what are the things we should be doing and the things maybe we should not be doing in order, again, to achieve those uh, objectives. But having that that vision, that thinking, it is uh, very important uh, for all of us. So, um, again, um, today for me is to really bring this report into what it is for Latin America and the Caribbean and, and what we are doing in terms uh, of that. So um, the first thing that really struck me for looking at this report that I think that really applies to uh, what we're thinking about Latin America and the challenges that Latin America and the Caribbean are facing today is the trade-off of the short-term and sustainable achievements with for longer-term sustainability. And I think that this is really related with a uh, crisis. So we've been going through many different kinds of crises. People call them the three Cs, no? Conflict, uh, climate, and COVID-19. But these are just examples. And I think that all these crises, we're seeing them um, that they are um, even closer in time when we're facing them, and also they are becoming more um, important or the, the impact on the regions are being even more uh, sought. So I think that we need to be really better prepared to face the next one. And again, we just don't know what's going to be the next one if it is in one of those seas that we're talking about. But in any case, we know things that are um, that they are out there and they work and we already know things that are not working and we really need to think of this holistic way of how to achieve and how to be better prepared to face the next uh, uh, crisis. So when talking about this, the first words that it comes to my mind always is innovation. And how are we going to work towards that innovation that we really need? And innovation in a broader sense, no? So what I'm talking about innovation is in terms of policy, technologies, but also institutions. Um, and those are the things that, that the three pillars of innovations that we really need to understand and see how uh, they are. And so it's what policies, what technologies, uh, what institutions, but also how are they designed where should be promoted and how should be uh, done. And I think that um, we cannot really stop there because we need to really be able to see how can um, achieve this in terms of the implementation of the policies and the adoption of the technologies. So we really have to, to connect these three um, steps in a way of saying it. So how can we find the evidence, how we can promote the innovation or implementation that adoption that it is uh, out there. So following with all this thinking and going back to Latin America, at IFPRI with uh, IICA and the University of uh, Notre Dame, we're doing one initiative that it is called Avanzar 2030. And it kind of really fits very well into um, um, this uh, report and and the challenges that Latin America is facing in the sense that what we're trying to do is to do a call for action based on the messages that all the ministers of agriculture from the Americas signed going into the UN Food Systems Summit in terms of what are the things that are necessary for Latin America and the Caribbean to do in order to have the agri-food systems transform for the region, of course. And so um, this project, what it does is to look at the evidence that it is out there and then how much it will cost and then how uh, we can so figure it out, this bringing those messages into, a, into an action. So it's this implementation, this adoption that I'm mentioning. Um, and I think 
think that at this time it will be very um, important for the region as well, given that it will also give a sense of how much it will cost. So not only to show the path on where are the most efficient interventions to fix these uh, objectives, but also how much it will cost. And then it will be just a matter of how we, we can implement uh, uh, those. Um, and then in terms of, um, you said something about capacity and, and how we can um, in, in, um, make that happen in, in the region. And this kind of initiative, the one that I'm saying now, ANSAR 2030, it really fits also into that because it's to work with researchers from the region and to really work um, um, in a very broad team in which everybody will um, uh, be included. And so I would just like to finish um, with just one line that I really like from the report as well, um, that it says the strategic, a strategic and policy options have the power to shift our future. And that's, again, um, um, something that I really like from the report. And that is something, a big message that I think we have to keep in mind. Uh, with this, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Valeria. And now we go over to Joseph Glauber. Joe, um, and just in case someone in, in our online audience doesn't know, prior to joining IFPRI in 2015, Joseph spent about 30 years at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, including as chief economist from 2008 to 2000. 2014, in which role he was responsible for the USDA agricultural forecast and projections. So it's a loaded question. Uh, Joe, what are the big challenges facing US agriculture, do you think? And what does it mean for the rest of the world, particularly developing countries? No, thank you, uh, Eugenia. Uh, I think with your your brief bio of me, people can figure out how old I am, but that's, that's okay. <laughs> uh, uh, let me uh, uh, first echo uh, Lorenzo, uh, Valeria's uh, congratulations to Lorenzo, because I think this is a great report. I really like the discussion of trade-offs because so often we look at policies and talk about how great they are and whatever, but I think it is really important to recognize that there are trade-offs. Um, uh, Eugenia, you asked about the U.S. and and I think you know, uh, of course, the U.S. has had a very long history of providing support to the agricultural sector, um, dating back to the early days of, of the Republic with sugar tariffs and other things to to protect farmers. Uh, but it, interesting, if you look at when when the Department of Agriculture was created. The two major functions of the department back in the 1860s was to provide seed to farmers and to provide information about markets and things like that. And so I think, you know, these are things that that I think most economists like me would say these are public goods. These are very these are appropriate roles for the government to help research and development, to help provide information. But but obviously, if you look at at the U.S. in particular, uh, you know, our programs mostly date back to the 1930s. Uh, that was a time when, when farm income was very low relative to non-farm income, you know, uh, and there, there was Congress and others wanted to do something to help uh, improve agricultural uh, income, uh, farm household income. And I think that that in that there were a lot of public good goods addressed, things like conservation, other things that uh, environmental outcomes that I think we would look at today and say, oh, those are important things and certainly are talked about in, in this report. Uh, these were all sort of seen as temporary measures. And uh, here we are 90 days or 90 years later, uh, those programs are still very much in place. Now, I think the good news is, is, is discussions have changed People recognize the importance of things like climate change and how to address greenhouse gas emissions and other sorts of things. People are talking about, uh, you know, repurposing uh, programs uh, uh, to, to address these. But I think the, the difficulty is I see politically in the US is that for the most part, there's a lot of support for these programs among the uh, farmers and others. And, and that has evolved over the last 10 years, I think, where there is good support for that. Unfortunately, I think most see this as in addition to the suite of programs they already receive. So not so much a repurposing is adding more. And I don't think that's where we want to go. I think that, that uh, again, I think it's important to get um, to, to improve uh, 
uh, outcomes, environmental outcomes, nutritional outcomes, climate outcomes. And that's what we really, that's the real uh, focus that I think we should be looking at, looking at those trade-offs and trying to figure out how to move forward. Um, so I, I'm, I'm skeptical that we're gonna see this right away, but I, I hopefully that reports like this and other reports that we have seen will uh, further focus the debate and um, I think, uh, uh, you know, echo Maximo's words about, you know, trying to align uh, policy goals with outcomes and, and do that in a way that, that we actually see progress moving forward. And um, again, I think this focus on public goods is, is uh, particularly important. But again, congratulations, Lorenzo. This is excellent book. Uh, uh, the uh, FOFAs are something that I, I read when they come out. I'm always excited to get it. And this is uh, this this one didn't let me down. It was it was quite good. So thanks. Thank you, Joe. And my next question will be addressed to Elisabetta Gator. Elisabetta, much discussion on the future of food systems focuses on agriculture and markets. But how should we consider the role of natural resources and ecosystem services in this process? Uh, thank you, Eugenia, for, for, uh, for this question. And good morning, everyone. Good, good, good afternoon. Uh, let, me, let me join Valeria and Joseph in congratulating uh, uh, Lorenzo and, and, and his team uh, uh, for adding this important uh, piece to to the literature, you know, it's we need evidence. We need uh, uh, we need this type of uh, of studies. Um, going back to your question, Eugenia, we should not forget that one of uh, the biggest challenges we have, uh, one of the biggest, the greatest objective we have, is to secure adequate food that is healthy, that is safe, uh, that is of high quality for all, uh, and uh, uh, to do so in an environmentally sustainable manner. Therefore, we should not look at the food system in isolation, but we should look at the food system in relation to the land and water system. And we should really look and understand how synergies and trade-off across the food, land, and water system are, uh, are happening. Um, and we need to add another layer of complexities into it because we should look at how food, land, and water system uh, is uh, not only interacting among themselves, but how is also uh, facing challenges that are generating by a number of interacting mega trends that have uh, 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 that are happening across spatial and temporal scales so also massimo uh, at the beginning of of, of his uh, presentation you know here we are dealing with phenomena that are happening uh, at a, a different scale, uh, temporal scale, space, uh, te temporal scale, uh, spatial sc uh, sp scale. So, how do we understand uh, all these interactions? And uh, and here is uh, you, you know how food, land, and water system interact uh, with the uh, with the double burden of malnutrition. Here. It's not just an issue of having access to food, but also what is the quality of this food. Uh, let's not forget that 2 billion people suffer from macronutrient deficiencies and over 1.4 billion are over, uh, overweighted uh, across uh, the, the, the globe. Um, uh, so I, I, again, here we, we go back to the quality of food uh, to the, uh, and the role that the land uh, we use for generating this food is 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 treated uh, climate change climate change is not only affecting the production uh, of uh, of uh, of food but is also affecting the land coverage the land distribution and is also bringing a number of new pests and diseases a number of biotic and abiotic stresses that are affecting Thing, the food system, the agri-food system, uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, 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 in general. And, uh, and last but not least, uh, another big element that is having a, a, a repercussion in, on how the food system is working is uh, the reduction of agriculture 
cultural biodiversity. Uh, you know, um, among all the loss of biodiversity, the agriculture one is playing a key role into, into this. Uh, we are using now, um, so, so what is the role of agrobiodiversity in offsetting uh, negative uh, externalities that are generated by the climate change, by pests and disease uh, increase, um, by nutrition deficiency. Um, we uh, usually use the agricultural system uh, to generate a number of, of crops um, that, that are limited, you know, from, uh, from a total of 250,000 plant species only 200 of them have uh, um, uh, have been commercially cultivated and only three of them rice wheat and maize are supplying 60 60 percent of the world plant derived calories but you know there is a universe out there that is playing a key role in making sure that the food system is healthy and uh, and is functioning now, the question of how we can include uh, all these elements in our analysis, I, I do believe uh, that uh, foresight is playing uh, 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 is, is a key tool in order to understand uh, uh, not only how the food system works, but how the food system works in relation to food and land uh, um, the dynamics and, and phenomena. Uh, but we need to improve the, the capacity of uh, communication uh, between the biophysical uh, domain and the, and the socioeconomic uh, one. We need to understand what are the repercussions, what are the trade-offs, what are the synergies of uh, uh, this uh, complexity. So, um, but in, 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 this, in this context, for me, foresight is not only the quantitative analysis and tools we can use, Use, uh, but also how we can build and capitalize uh, from a, a wealth of information coming from uh, an engagement process with key partners, uh, with smallholder farmers that are the, at the very end are the one that are managing, uh, owning, uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, and using the, the food, the land, and water system, and their and their synergies, and are more more affected. So for me, it's key to embed natural resources considerations, uh, ecosystem uh, services considerations into the food, uh, into the future of, uh, of, of our food, uh, of food system. Uh, and we need to improve our uh, methodologies of analysis and what is here most important is for us to focus on how these interactions are happening and why there are these interactions these synergies and these trade-offs so we should focus now less on what is the result but we should focus on what is the process of these complexities to uh, to happen Thank you, Elisabetta. Thank you very much uh, for this comprehensive response. And we are now moving to our last panelist, Keith Wibbe. Keith, you lead the foresight work at IFPRI and are also the lead of the new CGI research initiative on foresight. Can you tell us a bit more about how foresight approaches help explore alternative pathways for food system transformation? And what are the practical applications of this work? Sure. Thank you, Eugenia. And I'll, uh, at the risk of repeating my colleagues, I'll echo uh, their thanks and congratulations to Lorenzo and FAO. Really enjoyed the report. One thing that I felt was uh, unique about it is that it really looks uh, behind the pathways at some of the uh, political and social factors that influence policy and institutions and behavioral pathways and uh, highlight the importance of the choices that we make. Uh, today in shaping how the future of food and agriculture will evolve. I'd like to just briefly mention four points about foresight approaches to explore alternative futures. First of all, and others have already noted this, it's critical to recognize, as this report does, the inevitability and challenges of trade-offs in confronting food systems transformation. As Lorenzo noted, it's tempting to look for win-win situations. We shouldn't stop looking for those, but the reality is that food systems are extremely complicated and transforming them is extremely difficult. 
When you consider that food systems involve over 500 million producers and more than 8 billion consumers, each of them, each of us making our own decisions based on our own diverse interests and opportunities. It's not surprising that different future pathways are going to involve different mixes of impacts for different people. That's one of the things that makes evaluating different pathways difficult, let alone agreeing on desired futures and taking action to, to achieve them. That's why careful foresight is essential. Secondly, the importance of trade-offs means that it's essential to understand the interests and concerns of multiple diverse stakeholders. And this points to the need, as Elizabeth already noted, for participatory foresight processes and engagement with stakeholders and decision makers to understand the concerns they have, the challenges they face, and the different visions that they have for food system transformation. Third, while this sort of stakeholder participation and engagement are essential, so is careful analysis. We need to look critically and objectively at these trade-offs to try and estimate how big they are, who will they affect, and what options are available to address them. For example, recent foresight modeling has explored trade-offs between measures to reduce or offset greenhouse gas emissions on the one hand, and measures to reduce food insecurity on the other, there are uh, real trade-offs uh, in, involved in some of these uh, looking at different sustainable uh, development goals, for example. Other work, work has looked at trade-offs between different SDG outcomes under different investment strategies. For example, how things like investment in infrastructure can improve market access and benefit both producers and consumers, but at the same time, it can also increase pressure on land and water and other natural resources. The same work has explored how these trade-offs can be reduced, for example, through uh, targeted investment in research and development and extension efforts to increase productivity, or as Maximo said earlier, to do more with less. A fourth point, these different foresight approaches need to be seen not as one-off exercises in search of the right answer to these big problems, but rather as part of an iterative process of engagement and analysis tailored to the needs of particular decision makers, and which is repeated as necessary to address, address the questions that arise as part of the process. In a meeting last week, one of our partners who has many years of experience modeling agriculture and markets in Southern Africa noted that it's important to make the analytical results as robust as possible, but it's at least as important, maybe even more important, to make sure that the process of engagement with discussion, decision makers um, works to discuss together many goals and constraints and questions that are involved. Examples include working with national government partners to compare possible outcomes from different policy choices and uh, working with funding partners to compare outcomes from different investment uh, options that they may be considering. So if I can slip in one final point, I'd like to note that the CGIAR also, like FAO, has extensive experience in foresight including a new initiative focusing on foresight analysis at multiple scales, going from subnational all the way up to global scales, and engagement with decision makers, including national research and policy and research partners. Uh, just last week, we hosted a foresight partnership forum in Nairobi with policy and research partners from 15 countries across Africa as part of a process of engagement, capacity sharing, and improvement in methodologies and joint analysis to help make food systems more productive, inclusive, sustainable, and resilient. And as part of this broader effort, we'd be very happy to work with FAO and other partners to explore implications of the kinds of scenarios that they've outlined, as well as other possible futures and ways to address them. Thanks very much. Thank you, Keith. Thank you for keeping it short. Uh, it allows us enough time for uh, the Q&A session with our online audience questions. And let me, without further delay, just go over to the live questions that have been submitted so far. Uh, the first one is from Maria Dulce Alibangbang. Sorry if I pronounce it miscorrectly. The question goes, prices of basic goods are increasing, making the lives of those vulnerable populations difficult and cumbersome. How can we lessen the impact of hunger and malnutrition? What short-term solutions should be implemented in order to lessen the impacts of hunger and malnutrition? Um, shall I suggest that, that Lorenzo takes it? Or we have any other volunteers? Well, I may start. I mean, this is a $1 million question. Eh? It's, uh, it's, uh, clearly, uh, we, we have uh, short-term uh, quick fixes to address the issue of uh, food security, all social protection programs and uh, even vouchers uh, and even income transfers whenever they are needed. But uh, 
and uh, we know that we know that the price of food uh, as pretty much as the price of other resources is probably going to increase uh, together with the scarcity of these resources and uh, while in the short run we have to adopt uh, to adopt the quick fixes what i call quick fixes i mean to address to address immediate solutions including food distribution as such you know we know that uh, in the long in the medium long run we, we cannot keep relying on these mechanisms so we have to identify better ways of distributing income better ways of distributing opportunities uh, and uh, also the provision of public goods uh, will help a lot uh, in uh, um, redistributing access to food uh, as such you know so i know that uh, uh, i may not have addressed the issue as such but uh, i i invite you to distinguish what is short run from what is medium and long run you know because in the medium long run we have much, many more degrees of flexibility and degrees of freedom that we could not even imagine if we keep focusing on the short run we realize that uh, quick fixes may not last forever over thank you thank you lorenzo uh does anybody want to add something to this or shall I go to the next question? Yeah, I, I would just add, uh, you know, I, I do think Lorenzo's put it right. I think there are sh very short run issues here. And I think that, um, you know, there you want to make sure, you know, uh, trade is moving and, and you know, for short run droughts and, and things like that or disruptions like what we've seen uh, during the, the, the over the last year. Um, but over the longer run, there you know issues like productivity are very important, and and unfortunately, I you know the experience shows that uh, research and development you know can't be a we do it one year and then not do it the next year. I mean these are long term investments that have long term results, and I think that that's the other uh, uh, important thing to remember here. So it is long run, um, but. But we need to be thinking now on, uh, I think already we're thinking about, well, how can we achieve productivity gains, but do it in a sustainable manner and things like that. Over. Yeah, thank you, Joe. Uh, so there are a couple of questions related to the private sector engagement. I think it links back to very well to what has just been discussed, because it's obviously not only the, the policy, the, 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 the public support, but also how the private sector plays a role. So we have a question from Franz Verber in Netherlands, who asked, what is the role of the private sector, not farmers, but agribusiness, retailers, supermarkets, to increase food security, healthy diets, equality? etc um shall i suggest that keith maybe starts with this one sure i'll i'll uh, give it a start so i mean th this is this is the importance of looking at food systems and and not just producers and consumers obviously the the two ends of the system are, are critical but also all of the players in the middle that uh, are are uh, responsible for uh, transportation storage um, processing and so forth uh, elements of uh, food safety and efficiency that helps to uh, reduce margins in moving from producers to consumers which is one way uh, to uh, increase affordability and uh, so uh, the private so sector does play a critical role there. It doesn't mean that it's independent of, of the role that uh, governments can play in terms of uh, supporting things like in infrastructure. And again, uh, R&D, it's, it's, uh, there's an important public role there as well as important private sector role in the different uh, segments of the uh, supply chain uh, that are often um, left out of discussions that focus more on the production and the, and the consumption side. And actually, there is a follow up question from France as well to Yuki directly. He's asking if private sector behavior is an important factor in the foresight scenarios. Do you even factor them? In sure. This yeah. I mean, that's 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 a it's a, a fundamental part of the analysis. Obviously, um, models are always incomplete, so we don't capture everything. But certainly responses both of uh, producers and consumers to changes in prices are part of the interaction that the models typically look at. I, I will say that um, uh, different models focus on different parts of the food system. And so some are, are uh, look more closely at evolution uh, and incentives and interactions 
along the supply chain. Others focus more on the production and the consumption side of things. But though, definitely those private incentives um, are a critical part of that picture. Great, thank you. And let me move to the next question. And this one will be, I think, directed to Valeria because it's about the LAC region. Uh, and it's from Pierre Andres Jacinta. Given external and internal migration in LAC, loss of labor and local knowledge, discuss your vision, please, for a sustainable transformation of agriculture in the region. Thank you, Nina, and thank you so much for the question. It's um, it's a very complex uh, question, and that I think that it includes uh, many different um, aspects. So I, I may not be able to to answer in just uh, um, one once. But I think that that in terms of uh, Latin America and their cultural transformation, is this is this words that we use about uh, innovation? So how can we really uh, connect? Um, the production side in a good way in terms of that uh, sustainability. No? So Latin America is a region which is very important if we're looking at global food security, but as well in terms of global environmental sustainability. So uh, Latin America, more than anything, the Southern Cone uh, countries has been really and uh, play a key role in uh, exporting agricultural goods or food to the rest of the world and also inside uh, the region. So for me, one of the biggest challenges that we have is how can we keep producing the amount of food uh, that it is necessary for the growth of the population and all that, but how we do it in a sustainable way. So it is not just a matter of, uh, and I think that uh, Maximo said it, producing more, but with less. So how can we really keep up that uh, rate of innovation and that adoption of that uh, new, new technologies? How can we really use that in the best way uh, possible? And how then all the um, institutional part of that can also um, go hand in hand with these new innovations. So how can we deal with regulations? How can we really transform and move ahead with the regulation setup that we need in order to uh, be able to adopt uh, those new technologies? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Ayenu Gezi, applied ecologist from Ethiopia. Um, what could be the contributions of biotechnology and genetics engineering in the future of food and agriculture? And what would be the impacts of biotechnology and genetics engineering in the integrity of natural ecosystems? Um, may I suggest that maybe Elisabetta takes this one? You're muted. Sorry. Uh, sorry, uh, yes, I was muted. Uh, um, thank you for this question. Uh, in interesting uh, question, difficult also to answer. I do believe they play a key role. Uh, so uh, we as a scientist, uh, we need to uh, we need to, to explore, we need to understand what is the role of this technology and how can the, they can be scaled out into the into the system and can be then adopted. So here a big issue is also about the adoption of these technologies and, uh, and, uh, and understanding the spillover effects. So how can we reach a bigger portion of, of, of the population? But I do believe that uh, CG centers, I'm coming from the CG centers, I'm so yes, we should continue investing, looking at the ethical side of, of things, of course, but we should continue investing on research on this. Thank you. Uh, there is one interesting question I'm very tempted to, to ask. Uh, we don't have uh, any people from Ilri here, unfortunately, but that's about meat. And it's about how much will alternative meat technologies disrupt the global food system during the next 30 years? and reduce risks to sustaining agricultural production. And that's from Dennis Garrity, Global Evergreen Alliance. Thanks for this question, Dennis. Um, any takers? I'm certainly willing to start. And I, and I think just, uh, I'd say in the short run, uh, not much. I mean, I think we're, we're beginning to see it. Uh, there's, still, there's still large gaps on, on the price side, there's still some gaps on, on things like taste and consumer preference. Um, you know, so they are, they've are already, however, made significant progress as a, as a niche product and, and are growing. 
Um, but again, um, you know, they, they, it has enormous transformational uh, potential um, and certainly for, uh, particularly when one's talking about plant-based uh, meat products and things like that, obviously having uh, um, uh, or plant-based meat substitutes, having uh, uh, real large potential impacts on things like greenhouse gas emissions and, and other things. But at least from the consumer side right now, it's hard to see, it's hard to project because you're at such a low level of, 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 of growth right now, or just, it's just such a small niche market. But I'd be interested in hearing uh, what others might think on this. Others? Evgenia, yeah, I'll, I'll add. Um, not not so much on the alternative and, and meat substitute products, but just on the big changes that are happening in consumption of meat anyway. I mean, there's 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 large changes, shifts in 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 consumption, including um, slowing and in some case reduced demand for red meat, um, very large uh, in real and potential increases in demand. Uh, as incomes rise in developing countries, but most of that um, focused more on uh, poultry and, and uh, so forth, rather than than following uh, Western patterns in every regard. It, it, it's a it's a critical question. And it's one that's certainly uh, central to the analysis that we do, looking um, at the you know response to growth in income response to changes in technology response to climate change impacts and so forth and what those mean uh, not just in terms of environmental impacts greenhouse greenhouse gas emissions but also the health side of things uh, working together with nutritionists so it it is an area of, of tremendous interest and and potential change both in conventional meat uh, consumption and in these uh, new alternative meat products thank you uh, I will move to the next question. We have a, a little bit of time for a couple of questions. And there is one that is really important. It's about the post-harvest losses. Uh, Sarah Schwartz from ADM Institute for Prevention of Post-Harvest is asking, how can we integrate improved post-harvest management practices into policy so that inputs and yields are not lost? Um, Lorenza, do you want to start with this one? <clears throat> yes, thanks. Um... FAO is very much committed in uh, analyzing and uh, suggesting ways uh, and policies to reduce uh, food waste and losses at every level of value chains. And uh, the previous report of, so on the state of food and agriculture was uh, in 2020, if I'm not, I'm not wrong, was focusing exactly on this issue. And um, uh, I may say that reducing food losses uh, is not again it's not something that comes for free you know so you have costs in reducing losses and uh, the fact that you have losses is not is not because people are stupid and they like uh, throwing things away but because uh, reducing losses has a cost now being able to analyze the costs and benefits of every, every action and every investment uh, is quite important not to consider the reduction of food losses as uh, an objective as such but uh, to insert the reduction of food losses in a more general issue of increasing efficiency of food production, which is, in a nutshell, is producing more with less, if you want. You know? So, um, of course, investing in uh, solutions, in finding out solutions, as, uh, as uh, Joseph said, you know, this is a long run process. You don't invest in and out, you know, so you keep investing and eventually you, you find ways uh, this is very important, but also having the capacity to analyze, uh, to carry out costs and cost, cost benefit analysis of the various investment, in my opinion, is uh, extremely important for that. Thank you. Uh, anybody wants to add something on the post harvest losses? No, then we'll move to the next question. Uh, sorry. No, I mean, I, I think that one thing we, we haven't really uh, mentioned um, in this um, conversation is that the word actually uh, financing, no? So, for example, all these um, uh, post-harvest losses, sometimes they don't require a huge investment from the producer's 
point of view, but yes, maybe some small machinery or something that it would really help in reducing that uh, food loss. So understanding where the food loss is coming and how can it be solved is definitely key. But then also to try to find the right ways on uh, um, getting, making sure that that financing that they may need, that investment that it is required, again, if requires also some finance to go with that. So that, that, that will be another piece of the puzzles to, to fix. Thanks. Thank you. And I think we have question, time a little bit of time for one last question. And uh, I want to take this one from Lena Tami, PhD candidate in rural sociology and minor in geography in Pennsylvania. Uh, the question is, what is the role of agroforestry systems and agroecology in food system transitions, especially in those regions with high poverty and inequality? And um, shall we go to Elisabetta? Do you want to start with this one? Sorry, yes. It's definitely part uh, of our modeling efforts. You cannot make any climate change consideration, you cannot make uh, any environmental consideration uh, that it has a meaning if you do not consider the role of forest agroecology um, agroforestry uh, and, uh, and the, the, uh, also there the trade-off and synergies between the uh, forest system agricultural system uh, the, the livestock system so um, it, it is again definitely an element uh, that is part of our modeling uh, uh, efforts uh, that is part of our engagement uh, discussion uh, that plays a key role uh, in the in the agri food system transformation thank you elizabeth i don't know if others want to but for me it's really it's uh, it's really key and i'm telling you more coming from the diversity issue even the role that diverse uh, uh, agroforestry system are are playing so the 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 cost of conserving diverse forest diverse uh, agroforestry system uh, in in relation to the benefits that they are generating in the long run it's it's a key research topic for me and it's essential in the in the transformations of the food system Thank you. I think it's now time for us to move to the closing remarks. Thank you very much to the panelists. Uh, it's been, I think, a great discussion. And thank you for answering so many questions. Um, just making sure that we have Jocelyn. Yes, I'm on. Thank you. Yeah, on. And okay, thank, thank you so much. Um, I, I appreciate um, all of the discussion today, and it's my pleasure to provide some closing remarks to everyone. Um, this flagship report, uh, The Future of Food and Agriculture Drivers and Triggers of Transformation, takes a deep dive, as we just talked about in the last 15 minutes. We've covered seeds, we've covered um, and you know new types of meat, we've covered financing, we've covered agroecology. So um, it, it is really a broad and deep dive into the drivers and future of agri-food systems. Um, by proposing triggers that will be key to spark the transformation that is urgently needed, this flagship report builds upon all of our previous technical reports that propose strategic options uh, for a more re efficient, resilient, inclusive, and sustainable agri-food systems. I'd like to highlight the extraordinary approach taken to produce this report. It is the result of a corporate strategic foresight exercise, which brought together hundreds of technical experts in various uh, areas related to agri-food systems, both within and outside of FAO, as you can see who's been on the screen. Our Director General of FAO, Chu Dongyu, fre frequently underscores that we are not on track to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals, and it, it is only it is worth noting that we can only achieve them if agri-food systems are transformed properly to withstand adversity, so the entire agri-food system. We know that conflicts, climate variability and extremes and economic crises are occurring simultaneously in several already vulnerable areas. We know that uh, they will continue to happen. And in addition, their power to do harm has increased over the time, not decreased. 
As my colleague Lorenzo's presentation clearly lays out, hard choices will have to be made to, with difficult trade-offs. And everyone will have to understand that short-term benefits will have to be traded off for longer-term sustainability and resilience. But by thinking through some of these worst case scenarios, we can create contingency plans and reduce uncertainties and risks and develop a capacity to control the possible damage. More importantly, by thinking about desirable outcomes and futures, we can envision how to get there. Hopefully this report will serve as a wake up call for all of us to start planning how we can build a better future. Despite all this bad news, we in FAO are optimistic about the will of all the stakeholders, governments, civil society, informed consumers, responsible businesses, and all our partners in the global development community, including the people here. We are confident that we can share with them the responsibility of realizing the four betters, better production, better nutrition, better environment, and better life, leaving no one behind. I want to give my sincere thanks to all my FAO colleagues who contributed to this report, uh, to IFPRI and to my other colleagues on uh, this uh, webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jocelyn. Uh, it's, it's been Jocelyn uh, Brown Hall, Director of FAO Liaison Office for North America. Sorry for not introducing you before I started talking. And we now have one more uh, uh, contributor to our closing remarks. It's Charlotte Habebrand, Director of Communications and Public Affairs with IFPRI. Over to you, Charlotte. Thanks, Evgenia, and uh, many thanks to all of the presenters and, and speakers at this really, really interesting event. Thank you to uh, Lorenzo, Maximo, and Jocelyn for this collaboration, and, and thank you for launching uh, the FAFA here at IFRI, your, your second launch. Um, you know, we, we, we work really well together. I think we're both institutions that like to think about the future and uh, imagine what this future might look like because it really helps to fix minds i think on the possible solutions to get us to better food systems um, i also note that two of the speakers today uh, have worked at both institutions so that includes maximo terrero who came from ifri and keith who actually came from the fao to ifri so we've got lots of examples like that so i i, I thought that's a fun thing to point out let me also say that that I am a big, big fan of scenario mapping. Um, I think it's really an excellent way, again, just to fix people's minds on what the future might look like. Now, we can't predict what the future will be, but it does help us really drill down into some of these trade-offs and, and decisions. Um, and, and the point has also been made that it's not just the, the analytical work that's useful, but it's the engagement with policymakers that these kind or decision makers more broadly that these kinds of scenarios allow you to do. And that is really, I think, very, very powerful. And with that in mind, um, you know, two of the four big triggers for food systems transformation that you identify in this report have to do with increased consumer awareness and an awareness of improved governance. So it occurs to me that today we have uh, uh, 8 billion decision makers in food systems, right? Because we're all consumers. Um, and all of us consumers also obviously have a say, uh, we can influence hopefully governance as well. We will be 10 billion by 2050. So what I think would be really interesting for the FAO to do, considering the amount of work you've done on this very rich report, I think, each scenario deserves a more detailed discussion, presentation, different groups of stakeholders um, so that everybody can really um, imagine themselves in these four future scenarios and think about how their own choices and the, the choices of their politicians will influence food systems uh, in the future. And maybe your youth forum, I know the FAO as a, a very uh, good collaboration with the Youth Forum, these could be excellent discussions to, to be holding with the young people who are certainly climate change is on their minds, right? But, but they also, I think, increasingly are beginning to look at food systems and, and food systems transformation. And then I, I really like Keith's suggestion. Um, you know, we, we now have these four scenarios. We know that there's no perfect scenario, right? I mean, the most sustainable scenario, even that one includes some trade-offs. So this is, I think, where foresight can play a really important role uh, 
if we look at each scenario, how can we minimize the trade-offs? How can we get to the most positive outcomes while thinking about which trade-offs might be more palatable um, to others and how can we in general just minimize the, the amount of trade-offs? So I think some, some additional collaboration maybe around mapping out the potential policy responses or the potential innovations or the potential institutional um, systems that, that we may have, uh, how these could then play into addressing the key challenges that each scenario uh, represents, I think would be a really interesting, interesting exercise. So uh, many thanks, a really, really stimulating piece of work. And, and also just so impressive that, that the FAO has done this work, not just to talk about the future of food systems, but really to inform their own strategy at the FAO. And, and I thought that's really impressive. But part of the objective here was really to help you think through your long-term strategy um, uh, as well. So uh, many congratulations on this on this really terrific report and just encourage you to, you know, uh, get the word out. A lot of work has gone into it. I think lots of people uh, would benefit a lot from, from learning about the scenarios and thinking about what they imply about the many choices we all make as consumers, but also for all of the players and value chains and all of the actors in, in food systems. Many thanks and uh, wishing everybody a great rest of the day. Thank you, Charlotte, and thank you to all speakers and our online participants. We are now at the end of our time. Uh, I just want to remind that the recording of this event will be available on our website shortly and invite you to our next event on February 9th uh, at 8 a.m. Eastern time, and that the topic will be taking stock of Africa's agri-food processing sector. Thank you and have a good rest of your day.